Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly live program. I always have the great privilege of introducing to you men and women who, uh, by their deep commitment to Jesus Christ, have been drawn home to the Catholic Church. And they're here to talk about their journey. My guest this evening, Jerry Horn, will talk about his journey from being a pastor, an evangelical pastor, into the Catholic Church. But he'll talk about how a particular writing by Pope John Paul II caught his heart and opened his heart to the Catholic Church. And he works, we'll talk in a moment, for a Priest for Life and his work with that organization. The theme for tonight is the sanctity of life, and we'll talk about all different aspects of that. Remember, you're an important part of this program, so please call us with your questions at 1-800-221-9460 or send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Jerry, welcome to Journey Home. It's great to be with you, Marcus. The audience of, of EWTN is very familiar with Father Pavone and his programs and his work. Uh, he always has such a great witness. It must be a privilege working with him. It is a privilege to work with him, and work we do, I promise. <laughs> he keeps us very, very busy, and uh, he's uh, a lot of fun and is very, very devoted to his work, as you all know. Your position there is the... Uh, my official position is Senior Vice President, and I end up doing a lot of the media work and set up meetings for Father Frank at different parts of the country. and. Mm -hmm around the globe sometimes even, so right. it's great working with him. And you work with another organization? Yes, I also work with the Pro-Life Action League out of Chicago, Joseph Scheidler. Okay. I do media relations for Joe and Ann Scheidler there, and it's also a privilege working along with them. All right, great. Well, we'll talk a little bit about both those organizations later, especially if any questions come in about uh, the work that you do. But as usual, each week, let's start first with your journey and uh, give a little bit of the background, uh, talking about your early journey. You bet. Um, in 1953, I was born in Midland, Texas. Um, I grew up in the Southern Baptist uh, home. I used to go to the Sunbeams and, and uh, remember those days uh, early on as very special times. And I think back then was captured with uh, a tremendous love for the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, as time went on and uh, life went on, I went through school and, and uh, junior high and high school, I, I really came away from the church, yeah, even that church. So many, yeah. And then um, when I became a, a senior in high school, got very involved in, uh, so often uh, people do uh, drugs, sex, rock and roll, the whole nine yards there. And it as a freshman the in college. Late 60s, right? Late 60s, yeah. early 70s, yeah. it was the big thing. And I uh, went off to college, West Texas State University and um, Canyon, Texas. And uh, as a freshman student there, became very involved in uh, many different things. And at one particular point there, I realized through a group of students on campus, known back then as the Jesus people, <laughs> that uh, my life was headed in the wrong direction mm -hmm. and that I needed to turn my life around. Mm -hmm. And I did. Mm -hmm. Did you hear a call to ministry immediately or was it a little later? Or? I knew at that time in my life that um, I would never go back. Um, to that lifestyle and that I did want to serve, I wanted to serve the Lord with all my heart mm. and I never wanted to go back and that I saw such a need in our world and actually was a part of, of a crying world who needed mm. hope. And so uh, I realized my life, my lifelong verse was to know Him and to make Him known. Mm. And uh, that was the premise by which I came to know the Lord back mm. in the, the late 70s, early 60s, mm. uh, late 60s, early 70s. And then you went on to become ordained? Uh, did actually, you? I did. I, I became, um, uh, my wife and I actually, um, before we were married, we went to Bible school at Bethany Fellowship Missionary and Bible Training Institute up in mm -hmm. Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is a Lutheran-based evangelical training center for missionaries. Mm -hmm. And um, after serving there uh, three years of school and a couple of years of internship down in the Virgin Islands, working in uh, mm -hmm. the Christian publication of, of Bethany House Publishers and, and the work that they did there, we. Um, we came back to the States and we gave our heart totally over to ministry and was shortly ordained through uh, a non-denominational independent church, mm -hmm. much like the Assemblies of God. Yeah. And that was like in the early, well, the middle 60s, I mean, probably 70s, like 1976, I uh, was mm -hmm. ordained. You know, I think many of our Catholic audience may not understand from firsthand the, ex the phenomenon of those independent non-denominational churches and even ordaining people and, and how pastors may jump from one in, non, 
denominational independent church to another one and serve as a pastor. But, Absolutely. But That's there's a happens. shared but there's a shared theology and a shared deep commitment to Jesus Christ. Absolutely, there is. And uh, and uh, I hold a, a, those times as yeah. very sacred to me and I, I believe that that was the beginning of my journey yeah. home. <laughs> Looking back in that time, our theme for tonight is this sanctity of life. Uh, particularly, we'll talk about John Paul's uh, encyclical on that. I mean, you look back during that time when you were serving as an evangelical independent pastor, committed to Jesus Christ, as you said, for him and to him and tell him, tell the world. Absolutely. Where was your commitment and your understanding of the issues of, of uh, the pro-life movement at that point? It was interesting. I think if someone would have ever asked me, are you pro-life, I, pr I probably would have said, of course I'm pro-life. But I, like so many of my peers at that time, never really thought very much mm -hmm. about the pro-life movement or the issue of abortion. And um, I'm sorry to say that ambivalence was very much mm -hmm. a part of, of that whole uh, concept of, of the sanctity of life issue. and. Uh, it was, it was very sad because I think that f someone who is as deeply committed as to helping the homeless and those who are in need, I never gave much thought to mm. what abortion really was and what it did to our society and certainly to God's heart. Mm. Uh, it, it is amazing when I look back on how such sincere people, with a deep commitment to Christ and the scriptures, at the same time can have a very strong pro-choice perspective and think that's the loving perspective. Did you find that in, in the past? Absolutely, and maybe we can talk a little bit uh, later about, about some of those aspects, but I realized that um, later on in my journey, um, I would meet with many pastors as we traveled across the country and we shared our story of our commitment to pro-life issues after uh, mm -hmm. recognizing how seriously this affected the church and the heart of God, that many pastors confessed to us that they, even at one time or another, even counseled okay. girls to have abortions because they didn't know, you know, what else to do. It was yeah. sort of, they felt it was the compassionate response, what I call unsanctified mercy. Yeah. They felt that this would help more than anything. And I think that as uh, as we grew in, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and as the pro-life movement expanded, we were able to help many pastors come to a recognition that, th that it was a deep, and a, a terrible sin against God, and, and there was a lot of repentance and, and a, a coming home for them in those issues. But you're right, absolutely right. I think ambivalence and ignorance on all of our parts um, to the whole horror of abortion yeah. was something that uh, almost a pro-choice stand to say I'm pro-life, but say, well, a little abortion over here, you know, to make things better uh, was really very tragic. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there you were, ordained, servant, the Lord, uh, uh, living out your life verse, in a right. sense. And uh, well, what is it that, that got your attention, hit you with a two by four and got your heart open to the Catholic Church? Well, I'll tell you, it was, uh, it was a, an amazing experience and, and really a journey that, uh, that started many, many years ago. And um, one thing I, I, I will have to say right off the bat was um, I, g I was given a, a book called The Gospel of Life. It was an encyclical written by the Holy Father. And uh, I remember reading snippets of it, you know, just a little bit here and a little bit there, and it, it didn't have the impact. But one day I was on a trip um, going to Fargo, North Dakota, and uh, Marcus and I was about 37,000 feet, and I opened up this beautiful, um, this beautiful booklet, and I began to read the Gospel of Life. And it started out, the Gospel of Life is the heart of Jesus' message lovingly received day after day by the church. It is to be preached with dauntless fatality and good news to every people of every age and every culture. At the dawn of salvation, it is the birth of a child which is proclaimed as the joyful news. I will bring you good news of a great joy which will come to all the people. For to you is born on this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And I have to tell you that as I read, I was lost in a 
a waterfall of tears. The, the flight attendant came over, Mr. Horn, are you okay? And I just began to weep as I read and I read. I said, lady, you have no idea how good I am. Because as I read through from cover to cover the, the gospel of life from the Holy Father, I began to recognize that, that the struggles that I had gone through and mm. as an evangelical pastor were answered so beautifully in here. And it was, it was really remarkable. And so that was really uh, not just the beginning, but was almost at the, the crossroads of my uh, journey home. Go back a little bit. You, you had said there was, I remember you telling me earlier, there was a seed planned way back that I thought was interesting. Way back. When I first became um, spiritually aware back in the Jesus People days, um, and what some people would have known back then as, as a J Jesus people or a Jesus person, um, we were carrying Bibles around. We all wore crosses. We had long hair. We were sort of the Jesus freaks, as they said. And every morning we were deeply devoted to prayer. Every morning I'd go to prayer at the little Protestant chapel on campus. And then I'd go to school, then to work, and then at home I would come home and the Protestant chapel would be closed. So I would think, well, I don't want to go home. The roommates were all loud and everything. So I actually went into this little Catholic chapel there on campus. And I would start to say my prayers and everything. It was really neat because at the Protestant church we didn't have kneelers. And I thought, boy, this is really neat. I can kneel down and pray here. And so I would begin to pray. And the most remarkable feeling would come over me. I, I felt almost fetal. I, I felt the presence of God so strongly. Mm -hmm. And this became you know, something that was repeated daily to the point where I felt so great about being at this Catholic chapel, chapel, I stopped going to the Protestant chapel in the morning. So I'd always go to the Catholic chapel to pray, morning and at night and sometimes even at noon. And eventually this young priest came to me he said, you know, I see you in here almost more than some of our devoted uh, friends here, but you're never at Mass. I said, well, I'm not a Catholic. And he says, well, let me ask you, why do you come here? I said, because I feel the presence of God, stronger than anywhere I've ever been. And he said, really? He says, can I tell you a story? And he took me over <laughs> by the tabernacle and he explained the true presence. And I, I can't tell you the wave of thoughts that went over me. It was, I was afraid. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was filled with joy. I was filled with questions. But I just hid that in my heart for mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. for years and years. And as we go on here and, and share, maybe I can go back to that a that little one. bit too. We were talking about then the impact of reading this and how uh, it even drove, drove you to weep because of all that you had experienced in your, you had been doing pro-life work up until then, isn't that right? Right, that's true. In fact, I think you were just on that trip, you're coming back from the Beijing conference, I think. Actually, um, I, I literally had been working in the pro-life movement for several years, mm -hmm. full time. Um, for many years, I worked for Judy Brown in the American Life League. And as a matter of fact, Judy became my sponsor. Mm -hmm. But, um, in Beijing, uh, at the Fourth World Conference for Women, I had been considering Catholicism and seeing all these tremendous witnesses. But when I was at the Fourth World Conference for Women there, um, a lot of people um, don't realize that this was sort of like a pea shooter against a tank. But when I saw the Holy See and their tremendous offense uh, uh, in defense against the culture of death I tell you, Marcus, I, mm. I wanted to be a part of that church. Mm. You know, it, it was a, an amazing experience to see the action, the mm. prayer, the devotion, and then the action of the church. It was phenomenal to me mm. to sit back and to watch uh, this w without even a, a flicker of fear mm. and see how God won a tremendous victory mm. by the power of the church mm. and those who were devoted to it there. And then when you read this, you saw the meat behind oh, it was what unbelievable. the church stood, stood for. Absolutely. For years as a Protestant pastor and even a full-time pro-life worker, if you will, for years, that was my vocation. I knew early on I was totally devoted 24 hours a day. My wife, Bonnie, our seven children, we were totally devoted to the gospel of life. And, but, but the problem was that I never heard it articulated. Mm. My, brother, my brothers in the Lord, my pastor friends, I was, I was constantly frustrated as, a, as an evangelical associate pastor there for all those years because 
I kept it trying to help them understand that we were, we were to be a church of action, mm -hmm. that we were not only a church of prayer and of devotion, but that if we pray, then surely God would ask us to act. And so there at, at 37,000 feet, when I'm reading uh -huh. this, I realize how deeply the Holy Father articulated what so many of us feel, that, that this was the gospel of life. It wasn't just a, a pro-life person in the church, and it wasn't just the person who fed the hungry, but it was the entire gospel of life. And it literally changed my life on that plane. I, I tell you, it was the cherry on the whipped cream. I'd been at the crossroads. I had had a lot of experiences, and, and the Holy Spirit had drawn me closer. But when I read this, on the last word, and the, the, the flight attendant came up, she says, Mr. Horn, are you okay? I, and I told her, yes, I'm fine. I'm better than ever before. This was the cherry on the whipped cream. I got off the plane, and I said, I'm going to become a Roman Catholic. And at that moment in time, I got in touch with a, a lovely Irish priest, Father Gerald Weems from Stafford, Virginia, and at St. William of York began my classes, and mm -hmm. it, was, it was a tremendous experience there. Uh, this is a wonderful document. I remember when I read it. In fact, I read it on an airplane too. I think I can't remember where I was flying to, but that it's a I, part of heaven. Well, I, I guess so. It must be because you're way up high. But I, I got a, a like an early copy before it was published uh, off the internet or something. In fact, I'll take that moment to mention that I'm almost positive that the Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life by Pope John Paul II, is available on EWTN's website. If you don't have a copy, I'm pretty sure it's up there. I'll get corrected if it isn't, but I'm pretty sure it's up there if you want to download it to read it. It's wonderful. And because we, we recognize that an awful lot of people have not read this great, I thought it was a gauntlet when I read it. I thought John Paul was throwing the gauntlet down and saying, just like you said, let's get, let's action. This is what we believe. Now let's live it. And I've been a bit disappointed that an awful lot of people haven't taken that gauntlet and run with it. You know, haven't you know, been obedient to his call. But, but because people haven't read this, uh, t can you give us a snippet or two from this wonderful document to give a flavor to that? Absolutely I can because one part in particular, Marcus, that was such a tremendous blessing to me because of my great frustration within myself, not just pointing the finger at my, my fellow pastors who I was very frustrated. I was frustrated uh, within my own self. Yeah. But when I got to this particular point, where the Holy Father quotes this scripture, what does it profit, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but doesn't have works? The Holy Father continues, he says, by virtue of our sharing in Christ's royal mission, our support and promotion of human life must be accomplished through the service of charity, which finds expression in personal witness, various forms of volunteer work, social activity and political commitment, this is a particularly pressing need at the present time when the culture of death so forcefully opposes the culture of life. He continues on, it's, it's beautiful and I, I wish we could read it all. <laughs> it, it, he goes on to say, in the service of charity we must be inspired and distinguished by a specific attitude. We must care for the other person as a person for whom God has made us responsible. As Jesus as the disciples of Jesus, we are called to become neighbors to everyone. Where life is involved, the charity, the service of charity must be profoundly consistent. It cannot tolerate bias and discrimination, for human life is sacred and absolutely goes on to so. He's so calling us to, to, to put our faith into action. He also, in that, makes a very, in that document, makes a very strong scriptural foundation for the, the pro-life use of the church, Absolutely. and which is wonderful. Uh, and I think for our, especially our non-Catholic viewers that sometimes wonder whether the Catholic Church is scriptural. You pick up any encyclical written by Pope John Paul II, and it's scripture from the beginning to end. It's true, and, and even so many of uh, pro-life family leaders in the Protestant side. If you ever listen to the radio broadcast, Marcus, they're quoting from the Holy Father constantly. <laughs> and, and I think more and more people are recognizing that this is something that so many people have felt for years but couldn't articulate. Mm. And I think that's an interesting point. So many of my Protestant friends have read the, this encyclical mm. and I believe that it has become, as a pro-life movement, 
a catalyst and a, an evangelistic tool to draw people into the church. With your many wor years working in pro-life, you've been with it, I think 16 years, you, yes. you told me. Um, now as a Catholic, what would you say is a distinctive that you would describe to the audience that sets Catholic understanding of the pro-life issues apart from non-Catholic issues? Well, I think the distinction is a frightening one for a lot of my Protestant friends because the distinction is, is that there is no distinction. Um, their pro-life view, they recognize, is a Roman Catholic view. It's the magisterium teachings of the church. It's mm -hmm. the absolute truth. It's the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And I think that when people realize this, Marcus, they're drawn and, and they're afraid, but it's a seed planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe with my whole heart, it's been exciting for me to see when people come face to face with the distinction, but the reality is that it's very much the same and they realize that, where did that come from? Yeah. And it came from the church, That's right. the Holy Catholic Church. And you discover that reading history, you discover that reading the church fathers. When you see the early church fathers speaking out against abortion and against contraception, that was the teaching of the church from the beginning. Um, You've also mentioned in your, uh, your testimony uh, the importance of active faith. That's been a thread throughout your whole ministry, hasn't it? The, the calling people to put their faith into action. Absolutely. You know, early on I realized that one of the, the great things is that to, to be an expression, one of the things that Catholicism has done for me is my life worse, as we talked about before, was to know him and make him known. I think that my focus as a Protestant a lot of time was to make him known. Mm -hmm. But when you mm -hmm. bow before the Eucharist, you focus on the fact that to know him is even more important than to making him known. Because mm -hmm. if you know him, people will recognize him in mm -hmm. you because he is in you. And I think that once I was no longer an orphan, to the church, but that I, I was confirmed and I came into the church, that my action took a whole new light. And this is something that I've been able to, to bring to others, is to fight abortion, not to fight it, but to win the battle against the culture of death, that, that we're not being called just to fight against some arbitrary thing, but that we're being called to win a battle. And the action, um, without prayer and without devotion is certainly also very dangerous. But I think when we stay true to pray and to work, it is a tremendous thing. And more and more the pro-life movement has refocused on that very thing, mm -hmm. to pray the rosary and to pray in front of an abortion clinic and let the Holy Spirit work. We're seeing it all over the country from one coast to the mm -hmm. other where we, we pray in front of the clinic. We don't even have to say anything to the girls. They come out on their own sometimes. It's amazing. You mentioned praying the rosary and in front of a, an abortion clinic. Well, that's pretty easy for your family, isn't it? Actually, <laughs> it really is. We have, a whole, we have a whole tribe of I mean, in the sense that you live very close to the... <laughs> for four years, Mar Marcus, my family, my wife Bonnie, and at the time, our five children, we now have seven children, um, we live directly next door to an abortion clinic. And I was telling um, everyone earlier, uh, my first experience with the rosary is uh, during those early years. Still as a Protestant. Yes, yeah, still yeah. as a Protestant. We would pray with the Shield of Roses. They came out religiously, no <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> but they would come out and they would pray regularly out there. And I remember our almost four-year-old daughter at the time, Judea is her name. Uh, she came in one day at lunch after being outside on a very crisp morning and she announced to us that she wanted to say the prayer for lunch. And we expected the same little Protestant prayer. God is good. God is great. Thank you for this food. Let's eat. And all of a sudden, this little rasp voice peels out, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. <laughs> and my wife and I were like shocked. We were like, we're Protestants and our daughter's praying the rosary. And it was wonderful. And so that was our real firm introduction into the rosary. And so it became a, an easy thing for it. Why do you see the rosary as a particularly powerful weapon in this battle against uh, the culture of death? I think the, the divine intercession that the Blessed Mother, it's so cavalier to say these words, but when you're in front of an abortion clinic, you need all the help you can get. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, it, it's one time after another where the rosary is being prayed. It is the weapon. Mm -hmm. You know, it is the weapon. Uh, it's a tool of, compa it's, a, it's a weapon of compassion, mm -hmm. but it's a mighty weapon. And we have, we've seen 
many experiences, and I think that's what, what I feel. You know, you have doctors and theologians on your program, but the, the Catholic faith, I'm certainly not a doctor and I'm not a theologian, but I'm just a guy who loves God very much. And I've seen how when we pray the rosary, the results, just the good old fabric results of, of seeing a girl going to an abortion clinic, it's amazing. People are praying the rosary and pretty soon she'll come out and there may be a priest there. She, he hears her confession right there. Her baby is saved. It's a miracle. And when mm. you see that happen uh, a few times, you recognize that, that no words yeah. can express the power of the wonderful intercession that the Blessed mm. Mother gives us. And really the rosary is a, a, a putting your faith into action because in our creed we say we believe in the communion of saints. Praying the rosary is putting that into action. Absolutely. We believe in the intercession of the saints. Absolutely. And that's what the rosary is all about, asking for prayer help, for intercession. I have to tell you, I'll tell on some of my Protestant p friends, I'll tell you, more and more of some of these Protestants are out there. You can see them mumbling right along with us that's because right. they are seeing the results. They understand what Absolutely. it is. They've come to understand what it really is. Um, you, you read this book and uh, you came into the church, or at least you, you moved towards the church. There were probably a few doctrines that were hard along the way in making that transition, particularly in the area of, of the pro-life issues. Did you find, for example, that the church's teaching on contraception a barrier for you when you made your journey? Actually, uh, our coming into the church was, was almost as smooth as glass, but contraception uh, was certainly a very interesting thing. And I will tell you that during those years that we lived next to the abortion clinic, at the onset of that, uh, Pastor Norman Stone, who was my senior pastor at the time and who I worked with for many years, yeah. um, we, we asked to meet with the people that owned the abortion clinic. And as we sat with them, we, we said, look, we want you to stop doing abortions in our community. If you wanna do you know, all the other things that you say you do, that's fine, but just please stop doing abortions in our community. And for two hours we sat there and it was like a worship service to contracepting. Mm. And when I left that meeting, that luncheon, I have to tell you, we came away, my wife and I sat in the car and I put my head on the steering wheel and I said, you know what? Anyone who promotes and literally kills children loves contraception as much as these people. Surely as we drive out of this parking lot, we will make a commitment as a couple never to contracept again. Mm. And we didn't. And that was actually a catalyst for us coming into the church because it drew us closer to the tenets Again, of faith. Again, there's the teachings of the church. It, the diversity was really the thing that drove us home, closer on our journey home. One other thing I'd like before we take a break is uh, to have you talk about, and I know you mentioned this earlier, is that uh, the, in our talks, the witness of Catholic leaders as a model for the faith that you were being drawn to. Talk a little bit about that if you would. I'll tell you. Um, some of the finest people in the world. I have to mention Father Frank Pavone, certainly, who is, mm -hmm. is someone that I admire greatly and, and has helped me so much in, in my journey. Um, Joseph Scheidler, who mm -hmm. is a director of the Pro-Life Action League. He and his wife, Anne, have, have been my friends from mm -hmm. the early years of my pro-life movement. Joe's practically a father to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to just tell you one little thing about Joe. Remember the story I told you about my Protestant days in the chapel when I went to pray? Mm -hmm. It was Joe that took me through the Basilica uh, in Chicago at, at their church that as I began to walk through there that I recalled that experience. Mm -hmm. And Joe was right there with me and he knew and he had been praying for me for years. He knew I was a Catholic long before I did, he said. Judy Brown, the president of American Life League, who uh, she and her husband Paul, Judy is my sponsor in the church, who I love very, very much, and they're very special to me. In fact, they, uh, the day I was confirmed, I, I received uh, everything except, for, I say, what was it? <laughs> I, I received all the sacraments except for last rites and ordination. Uh, ordination. <laughs> uh, we even had our marriage convalidated that day. It was great. But uh, Judy and, and Paul Brown and the, the many other wonderful yeah. Catholic people that have been a part of our lives. The reason I wanted you to mention that is that we often we think about helping someone discover the Catholic faith, we think about doctrines, clearing up myths. We gotta remember it's our lives that will show, and our words will show them whether it's true or not. Absolutely. How do we live it out? And They walk out this the gospel of life yeah. and they were a great witness to, to yeah. so many, they really were and still are. 
Thank you, Jerry. Let's take a break. We'll be back in just a moment with your questions for Jerry Horn, Horn on many issues, including the issue of sanctity of life. Welcome back. My guest this evening is Jerry Horn, the uh, executive vice president? No, nope, senior vice senior president. Senior vice president of Priest for Life and, and also with... The media director for Pro-Life Action. That's right. We want to make sure both of those organizations are mentioned. Uh, so you've heard about some of them in the papers. Uh, we need to pray for these organizations and their good work uh, standing right up there in front. You know, so we need to keep them uh, in the front of our prayers. Um, let's take our first email. This one comes from Ron Talley. Greetings, Marcus and Jerry. An acquaintance is having great difficulty understanding why artificial contraception is forbidden while natural family planning is permitted to Catholics, since as he sees it, both thwart the conception of a child and therefore are equivalent. I have shown him every reference pertaining to this in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, yet he is still not convinced. He is a Catholic. Can you help with some elaborations? God bless. Well, I'll do the best I can. First of all, uh, I think we're talking a little bit about apples and oranges here, but even something more fundamental. And that's the whole idea of this anti-child mm -hmm. concept that we have. There, there is really an anti-child attitude and posture that has pervaded us through the culture of death. Mm -hmm. And I think that once someone deals with the idea that we welcome children, that the Lord has asked us to be fruitful and multiply, that there really is a difference between artificial contraception and certainly natural family planning. And the other thing is that a lot of people don't recognize that so many artificial birth controls are abortifacient drugs, and we have mm -hmm. to be very, very careful. Abortifacient meaning? That, that they actually cause abortion. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so we have to be very careful there. But then the other thing that um, I find also very interesting is the second part of the question. Uh, uh, if you could just go over that one second. Could you read that to me again, Marcus, yeah. that second part? This is uh, the second paragraph. I have shown him every reference pertaining to this in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, yet he is still not convinced he is a Catholic. Well, first of all, I think that when you show references and you go to the Catechism and somebody is still not convinced, uh, we need further to pray for that person because the catechism is not a smorgasbord to pick mm. and choose from. Mm. It's, it's basically the, the, the teaching of the church and, and one has to adhere to the teachings of the ch church if we are to be true and, and faithful to the church. And I think that uh, while we all struggle with certain things and we, sometimes we all struggle with rules, but I think that we have to uh, further pray for those people, that the Holy Spirit will soften their hearts and help them to understand th that this is what it says and this is what we abide by. A, a good point you've made here, and that is that the, the issue of nat natural family planning has to be understood correctly. Because I remember my, my wife Marilyn and I were on our journey into the church and we took a class on NFP offered by a local Catholic nurse. And we sat in the class for a couple times and began to notice that NFP was being taught specifically on how to prevent having children. Right. But that's the only way it was talked at. And, and God bless my wife who spoke up in the middle of the class and pointed that out. And the one thing she pointed out was that we live in a culture where the underlying presumption is this having 1.1 kids or 1.5, right? This right. underlying, and that we have to be a, a positive reaction against that and recognizing this is a subliminal pressure on us. In Absolutely. Our culture. That's why I, I am so happy that there are organizations and groups that are devoted to specifically to educate and who have the idea of changing the culture to end our love affair with yeah. contraceptive mentality, the anti-child mentality like the Gift Foundation out of Chicago. Yeah. Um, I would encourage people who have questions about that and God bless your wife's heart because I think that that's something that's really beginning to change the young couples, the new people that are coming into the church. The prayers of the, the yeah. faithful Catholics through the years and bringing 
bringing us new guys in has been great because there's a new enthusiasm, a revival, if you will, of people recognizing that we love children, we want children, and there, there are ways to, to change that cultural uh, diversion against not wanting children. Thank you, Jerry. Let's take our first call this evening. It's Michael from Pennsylvania. Hello, Michael. What's your call for us tonight? Hello, Marcus. Great graphics. Uh, my question is for the guest. How can the gospel of life be proclaimed to young people, many of whom have no experience of family life? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Boy, big challenge, but great it question. Is. It is a great question. And, and I would just say that uh, being a father of seven children, mm -hmm. You know, um, people used to ask me as a pastor in a Protestant church, he said, you have how many kids? <laughs> uh, seven, and he says, are you a Roman Catholic? I said, no, I'm just a passionate Protestant. <laughs> but now I can't tell people that because I can say, yes, I'm a Roman Catholic. But uh, not to be cavalier about the question though, I think that one of the greatest things that you could ever do and is to experience on January 22nd, the March for Life in Washington, D.C. If there is any way that you can see, witnessed in a, a tremendous way, the last four years, the March for Life in Washington, D.C., there's probably 95% young people there. It's absolutely the most remarkable thing. I think there is a revival of youth in our country, too. But for those who don't have that witness, it is very hard. Again, further prayer, not as a cop-out, prayer not as a cop-out, but to help direct them to live your life as the pro-life leaders lived out for me and for many others, to live out for them and to, to give them hope and to inspire them and to talk to them, to communicate with them about the gospel of life and tell them that there's a better way and try to get them to events like the March for Life or other events where there are massive amounts of teens going together who worship and who, who stand together with the church and who have a deep devotion to to the teachings of the church. It's very, very exciting, very inspirational. Thank you, Jerry. Let's go to our next email. This is from Jim. This is Marcus and Jerry. My wife and I are the pro-life couple for our local Knights of Columbus Council. We write short pro-life articles for our monthly KFC newsletter. Do you know of any national pro-life newsletters that we could subscribe to where we could get additional ideas for informational articles? <laughs> God bless you both, yours in Christ. Well, I would probably lose my job with Priests for Life tonight <laughs> and the Pro-Life Action League if I didn't say, uh, certainly Father Pavone has incredible amount of materials there. It's www.priestsforlife.org and also uh, the Pro-Life Action League has a site, www.prolifeaction.org. Mm. Father Pavone has tremendous amount of materials there that would, that would be a wealth to them, and uh, I'm sure he would be, you can email them and get uh, anything they would like. And even for the last caller, I'm sure both those organizations have information on teaching this, these uh, values to teens. Absolutely, a tremendous amount, absolutely. Great, let's go to Susan from Michigan. Hello Susan, what's your question for us tonight? Hi Marcus, um, actually I have a different question, but I just have to comment, I'm so enthused about your pro-life message, and my husband and I attended a, a pro-life dinner in Michigan, uh, fundraising dinner last night, and we are going to be the first state, as I understand, to put a one-year campaign, ad campaign on our um, television ah. stations, and I just Great. couldn't resist saying that. I've been pr sitting here <laughs> praying to the Holy Spirit that I say the right thing, so just um, a little message yeah. of that. But my question um, is not a pro-life question. Um, I have some friends who are non-Catholic, and I've been Catholic my whole life, and I, when I seem to bring up topics about the church, um, they seem to be almost afraid to hear my comments, and I wondered if you, both of you, as having been uh, Protestant in your upbringing, if you had like a, almost a fear of, of the Catholic Church rather than an animosity toward it? Interesting. Thank you, Susan. Well, first of all, I don't think I ever had a fear. I was always sort of in awe of the Catholic Church, mm. and early on I think I had a, a deep affection toward the Church. But um, I think that a lot of people fear what they don't understand. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very difficult. There's not a lot that one person can do to, to change a person's fear except to pray and to be a good witness to them. I don't know, Marcus, do you, can you add any? Well, of course, a lot of it depends on what a, uh, a Protestant's background is in understanding the church and what they've been taught. 
And there are an awful lot of things out there that are said about the Catholic Church that are not true. Um, and a lot of them came out of the polemics, the arguments uh, uh, the last couple centuries ago. And these things are still strong in the minds and hearts of many of those outside the church that, like you said, don't understand the church and so presume the worst. And so it can be fear and that can be a big barrier. How do you break down those barriers? Well, it's always grace that breaks down barriers of people's prejudice, mm -hmm. people's ignorance. So prayer is the number one, always the number one tool to use to help people understand the truth of the church. Uh, and then, as you've mentioned, uh, active lives so they can see that Catholics love Jesus Christ, are committed to Jesus Christ, seek to imitate and follow Jesus Christ in their words and their actions so that that helps break down some of those barriers of fear? I think, too, one of the things that, that we as Catholics, and I know I've talked to a lot of cradle Catholics, I mm -hmm. think they call themselves, <laughs> but who have been tremendous blessing to me, and to see their newfound enthusiasm over the, the stories that you tell here, mm -hmm. which is remarkable. But one of the things that's very important, I think, for, for Catholics, too, is to recognize that sometimes this fear is also the conviction of the Holy Spirit. People may be on a journey, very close, actually. Uh, they may be having their, their most grumpy time in their journey, and they, they may be opposing the Holy Spirit, and, and you may have caught them at a very critical time. And I think it's important at that moment in time, your, your words to them are so very critical. You need to be loving, you need to be compassionate, but don't be afraid mm -hmm. to invite them in. That's one thing, sometimes it, we fail to ask. Someone said to me, do you have any regrets, regrets about coming into the, the church? And I said, yes, a few, but one in particular. And I said that I didn't come earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think that if someone would have just really sat down and said, have you ever thought about, you know, joining the church? I probably would have said yes, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid of that either. I would have to say that for the first 40 years of my life, maybe 38 years of my life, I never once had a Catholic talk to me about the Catholic Church. Right. Not one time. Um, and I'm not pointing fingers at that, but just recognizing that we need to not be afraid ourselves right. to reach out. And that great parable about the sower who plants the seeds, well, we have lots of great seeds that are available to plant in the lives of our brothers and sisters. Uh, great books, uh, find out what books they might like to read, what style book they like to read. They're great Catholic novels, Stor books of conversion stories like Surprised by Truth or, or Journey's Home, uh, or get them to watch this TV show. Yeah, Absolutely. Might know. Let's do it on the radio. <laughs> it, it, it would be remarkable to see that. You know, um, I work with the media and, and the organizations that I work with, the national media, and there is so much hostility toward the national media. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I try to, to share with grassroots pro-lifers when I speak at conferences about this, I really scold them a lot of times. Now, th this is, is an interesting point because I ask people who criticize the national media, when's the last time you took a reporter out to lunch and sat mm -hmm. down and say, this is who we are, this is what we do, we're here from this time to this time, if we could ever be a help to you, please, here are our numbers. Do you know how many reporters are like, this is the first time anybody on your side of the fence has come to me? Yeah. It's remarkable. And I think that th there's a lesson to be learned there. We got tremendous response from that kind of thing because you build a relationship with that person. So, And I think that as Catholics who have been Catholics all of their lives, it, there's an old saying that, that is, is trite in of itself, that, um, that when someone is familiar they become really ambivalent. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the greatest things about becoming a Catholic for me, it's, it's exploded in my heart to be able to enjoy my faith in a, a whole new way. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage cradle Catholics to, to get a hold of the Holy Spirit and begin to enjoy their faith like they never have before. Mm -hmm. It's their prayers, it's their faithfulness through the years that brought people like me and you and others into the That's church. Right. I'm convinced of that, right. absolutely. My good friend, Anthony DiStefano, who, who is executive director of Priests for Life, he's about the only person that sat down with me at one point. He, he gave me a medallion, blessed by the Holy Father, I never forget, and, and he handed it to me at a restaurant. And, and it, was, it was practically an invitation into the church. And I, I'll tell you, I, I can't tell you my heart leapt with joy <laughs> because someone actually, it was like an invitation. So don't be afraid to invite people to join.
Let's take this next email. It comes from your sister in Christ. Hi, Marcus and guest. As one who've, who have been there and done that sorrowfully, please tell all women and men who at some time in their lives got an abortion, aided someone to get one, or insisted someone get one, that through the divine mercy and unconditional love of God, they can come back to the sacraments. Find a good priest to talk to, go to confession, to be cleansed to receive Jesus. What an awesome God we have, as Mother Angelica says. There's a witness of someone that's, that's been through the pain and the positive uh, of statement to that they can return. Talk a bit about those that have been through the pain of abortion. You know, um, it's amazing. Like I told you, for several years, my wife Bonnie and I lived next door to an abortion clinic, and we would have the uncanny uh, experience each day of our life where uh, young women, young couples, older couples would come to our door first and we would have the opportunity to share the good Lord with them and, and, and invite them not to have an abortion and ask them please. Mm -hmm. And that's oversimplifying. And sometimes they would walk right out our front door and into the mm -hmm. abortion clinic. And to see those young women or those couples come back months later was absolutely one of the most devastating experiences of my personal life back in the early days. I think the most remarkable thing that I've seen is the compassion of the, of the Holy Roman Catholic Church to women who have had abortions. Mm -hmm. I would send these women who would come to us to women generally who had had abortions, but also to groups like Project Rachel and other women who have, have been sanctioned by the church and, and priests that work with them in concert, who actually invite them to join back and through reconciliation process, be able to actually become the champions of the pro-life movement. And that their, the loss of their babies' lives have been become memorials actually to newfound faith mm -hmm. and sort of a reminder to all mm -hmm. of us that forgiveness mm -hmm. is only just a little bit away. Thank you, Jerry. Let's take our next caller, Anthony from Louisiana. Hello, Anthony. What's your question for us tonight? Hi, Marcus. Hi, Jerry. Hello. Uh, Hello. Question, uh, Jerry. Uh, I've kind of came from a, a different path that you did, uh, being born and raised in a Catholic church, and uh, when I graduated from a Catholic high school and went to college, and uh, kind of got embraced by uh, a lot of very fine and wonderful Protestant people. And uh, you know, uh, enjoyed that lifestyle and everything. And uh, I'm getting up in age now, and I've uh, come back to the church about three years ago. And it kind of happened the same way you said. Uh, I'd gone to a place uh, I couldn't find a chapel that I was looking for, and I went to one place that was having adoration, and uh, it it just you know it, it had stuck with me uh, for so many years, and I didn't realize what it actually meant until I went back. And I think it's great. But having said that, uh, on the lines of uh, the, uh, the pro-life movement, how can we as uh, Catholics get involved on a local level to, uh, you know, to promote this and to uh, make people aware of what's going on? Thank you, Anthony. That's a great question because we're talking about act of faith. We certainly are. And action can be taken right away. You know, there are so many things that can be done to promote the sanctity of life. And really, the organizations in the country, you know, um, I talk to a lot of our benefactors and donors for the different groups, and they always say, can't you all work together? And, you know, I think that the pro-life movement is as diverse as each human mm -hmm. being. We mm -hmm. have, God has given us the pro-life movement with all of its different facets. Mm -hmm. And there are so many different, um, strains of the pro-life movement. Some are political, some are action oriented some are sidewalk counseling, some are or letter devotional writers, prayer. devotional, all of those different mm -hmm. aspects. And what I would encourage you and others, all those who are listening who want to become active in the pro-life movement and really active promoting the gospel of life mm -hmm. is to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you an idea of what your, what your area is. Contact your local pro-life organization and ask them what they do locally and, and become informed about what's going on locally because I can almost assure you that there is a lot of action going on in your community and they need your help. The pro-life movement needs volunteers, 
uh, like you wouldn't believe. And I'm sure that you could play a very special role, that we all can play a special role. We just have to find that spot in that group that we're supposed to be working with. So I would encourage you and all those who are listening with the same type of question to contact your local pro-life organization. Call Priests for Life, call Pro-Life Action League, call the American Life League, you know, all the different groups, other National Right to Life, other groups that are doing different things and find out what you can do to help. And uh, I can assure you, um, there were, during the, one of our walks across America, my senior pastor, Norm Stone, I, I think he had a great idea. Once he prayed, he said, I hear these people praying all the time, oh Lord, how long will you let abortion reign in America? And he said, you know what the Lord tell, told me? He said, the Lord told me as long as we let it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's where we, we have to realize that there is a place for us to act and to do something. And you can never underestimate. You say, well, I'm older or I'm younger and I really can't do anything. What mm -hmm. good can one person do? I tell you, one person can do a lot of good. You can never underestimate what you as an individual are capable of doing. And some people say, oh, well, Father Frank does such a great job. And he does. He's marvelous. But I see people out on the street who nobody knows who they are. And they save lives every day, every day. They're the unsung heroes. So don't underestimate the power of one person and what you can do. That reminds me of the statement of another encyclical by our Holy Father on Christophilus Laeci, in which it reminds us that we laity are the front lines of the church. We are the ones, the laity, who are out there in the world, out there fighting the battles in every day in our work and we have interaction with people who have these very questions all the time in their lives, who may never have any contact with a priest, but they have contact with you and, and with me. And so it's through our witness that we can speak out on the issues of pro-life. I think we had another email. I just saw a sticking, here we go. Let's go with this next email. This is from Mark S. in Franklin Lakes, New Jersey. Dear Marcus and Jerry, when I was a news reporter several years ago, my first editor said the reason men are so adamant about abortion, and women were not, was because it came down to an issue of control. The inference was that the church and society were male-dominated and, as such, feel a need to control what they do not have direct power over. What do I say as a man to this belief that abortion is a man versus woman issue and only women have dominion over their bodies? Well, that's a very good question, and I think that um, Father Pravone has an incredible uh, sermon that he gives a lot. This is my body. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, if you get a chance to go to our website and you can listen to that, it's an incredible uh, testimony to exactly what you're saying. Because in my uh, active years in the pro-life movement, um, I've been face to face with many of the feminists, Patricia Ireland, the president of the National Organization for Some Women, mm -hmm. uh, and, and many of their leaders, the women-dominated organizations. Uh, I think there's a reversal here because it's not men that are, are trying to dominate, but women with a certain philosophy mm -hmm. who want to dominate. And I don't think you can get into this incredible tug of war uh, uh, about the sexes here. But I do believe that there is a tremendous need for men to be sensitive to women. But I also believe that we can't just completely relinquish our responsibility. I think abortion, men have a tremendous responsibility and have negated their responsibility as men and have pushed women into abortion mm -hmm. because of their own irresponsible lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And I think women have become trapped to abortion. Thank you, Jerry. We've got about a minute to go. Explain with you, Wood. Uh, how your own journey into the Catholic faith has drawn you closer to Jesus Christ, your Lord. My own, I've become closer to the, to the Lord in these uh, few years as a Roman Catholic, I think because of the Eucharist, the, the, the sacrament of the Eucharist, because I no longer feel like a, an orphan any longer. I feel a part of the family of God in a way that I never felt before, the frustrations that I once had, but to be able and to go and to kneel in the presence of, of Christ, filling us with uh, an incredible, unspeakable, um, our given language can't really tell us. The incredible faith that God has instilled into us to, to pray and to obey, to work, to do, to humble us. But I feel an incredible, incredible new life inside of me to go on and to pursue 
the Right to Life movement and all of our work. Gary, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you for your witness. Thank you it's a very great much. Privilege to have you here and challenging us to step out in our faith and, and as they say, uh, walk the talk, live our faith. Thank you very much. Your own witness of your life is that very thing, and thank you. Also, thank you for being with us on the journey home. It's always a pleasure. God bless. Join you again next week. See you then.